All right, so good evening. Um, my name is Christoph, um, Product Design Manager at Facebook. I've been working at Facebook for uh, four and a half years now, um, and I'm currently working on social VR. Uh, and our team is trying to figure out um, what's, uh, what virtual reality can bring to the table when it comes to social interactions. Um, and so today we're going to talk about you know, how we design for virtual reality. I don't know how many of you have ever experienced virtual reality. Maybe raise your hand if you've ever tried anything remotely. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so not, I'm assuming not a lot of you have ever designed for VR. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, uh, in particular, social experiences, what's, what's particular about that, um, what type of challenges we face, what type of problems we solve, uh, and how we try to solve them. Um, but before we start, quick warning, uh, VR is very new, and uh, as a design community, we're still exploring what works and what doesn't. Um, and so a lot of the things we're going to share today may not be valid in a few years. So please bear with us, we're still exploring. So at our conference, uh, Oculus Connect last year, Mark Zuckerberg talked about how VR has the potential to be the first people-first computing platform. Um, for decades, we've been designing computers and smartphones around applications, but that's not how we think as humans. We think people first. Uh, everything in our lives is around people. Uh, and so with virtual reality, we have a unique opportunity to kind of switch that around and put people at the core of the experience and then build a utility on top of it. And that's exactly what we've been trying to do with our team. Um, we've built this first product called Facebook Spaces that we launched in April this year. Um, and with Spaces, you can be with your friends in a virtual space, no matter where they are currently in the real world. So you can be with your sister who lives in New York, and it feels like she's standing next to you. Uh, and that's really the core of the product. It's really people. Like, the people you're with as are what matters the most with spaces. Um, and then, you know, once you're in there around this virtual table, you can do whatever you want. You can explore any place in the world. You can go back in your old memories that you've captured. Um, you can exchange photos, videos. You can draw in 3D, create objects, go live, take selfies, um, everything. So uh, I have a little video that we made when we introduced the product um, that kind of shows what it looks like. The audio is a little low. This is, hey Jack. Are you all excited for our trip? Yeah, and look what I found. <gasps> this is so cool. Is this the same spot we're going to? I hope so. And look, I think that's where we're taking the boat tour. Oh, I love it. Look, I'm going to go chat with Melissa, but you're setting up the party room, right? Yeah, I got it. Great. See you later, Jack. All right. See you later. Bye. Hey, girl. Guess what? What? I got the apartment. Wow, nice. Look at your balcony! I know, it's amazing. No roommates. <laughs> I have it all planned out. The lucky blue couch. Yes. This table with this floor. <gasps> Perfect. <laughs> Jack keeps calling me. Can we talk later? Sure. Bye. Surprise! <laughs> Happy birthday! Thanks, you guys. Happy birthday. No, stop, don't let like this song. Okay, hold this balloon. You know we gotta do it. Birthday selfie! Oh my god. <laughs> Don't forget your birthday hat. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Hey! Whoa, hey birthday. my birthday hat! So that's Facebook Spaces. Um, all right, so I've broken down today's presentation into three sections. Uh, first, we're going to talk about presence, which is a term you will hear a lot every time you go to a virtual reality talk. Um, so we're going to talk about what it means and how we design for presence. Then we'll talk about agency and how we can design interactions that really deliver amazing VR experiences for people. Um, and finally, we'll talk about how we design interfaces for VR, and in particular, in an experience where you're with other people. Um, so let's start with presence. Uh, so presence is the bread and butter of VR. It's um, the feeling that you're there, physically present in a non-physical world. Uh, so what your e eyes are seeing, what your ears are hearing, everything that you're, that everything is telling your brain, like this is real, you're really there. And so you start believing it, that's, that's presence. So that's obviously what we're trying to aspire for anytime we design a VR experience. Um, and presence is usually separated into three different constructs. Uh, Self-presence, the feeling that the avatar you're seeing in the mirror is you. Um, social presence, the feeling that the people around you are real and they're really those people that you know. Um, and spatial presence, the feeling that you're there, no matter where that there may be. Um, 
So one of the cool things about working in VR is that our team gets to do some of our meetings in VR. And so um, that allows us to learn a lot about what works and what doesn't in a social VR experience. Um, and one of the first things we learn um, is that being able to identify someone in VR when you're in a group conversation is really important. In the very early days, we try non-human avatars. We made those cute looking rabbits. Um, and very quickly we realized that even if we each had a different color, we had our names floating above our heads, it was kind of really hard to have a good conversation and remember who was who in the room. Um, and when it comes to self-presence, uh, the main driver is avatars. And so it's really important for us to figure out how to make avatars that you know, feel like they're you. Uh, and the difficulty with trying to make an avatar look like you is that there's always a risk of falling into the uncanny valley where the more realistic you get, the creepier it ends up being in VR. Um, and so that's because as humans, we're really experts at recognizing human motion and behavior. And so whenever something is not perfectly right, like someone is talking and suddenly the mouth of the avatar stops moving, we immediately catch that and that stops, that breaks the illusion. So when designing Facebook Spaces, we've experimented with many, many different types of avatar systems. Um, and with every exploration, some of them being kind of, you know, we're looking on a 2D screen, we had a, a clear goal. We wanted to try 3D eyes versus 2D eyes. We wanted to try, you know, uh, blocky shapes versus nice, nicer curves. Um, and a lot of the exploration that seemed pretty interesting on paper when we looked at them on a computer turned out pretty disturbing in VR. Uh, and the opposite was also true. Like a lot of the ideas that we thought would never work in VR actually turned out pretty successful. So in the end, we landed on some very stylized avatars that kind of act as a cartoon representation of yourself. Um, and these work really well with today's constraints of the VR systems that we have, uh, as they're pretty charming, they're pretty inviting, um, and they're also pretty forgiving. Uh, and they allow expressiveness and a pretty good self-representation. You could, this is Mike Booth, one of the, the, the team members. If you were running into him in, at the office, you would actually recognize him. So alongside uh, figuring out how, uh, what our avatar should look like, we also had to figure out how people would create their avatars. And we really wanted to avoid having an experience where people have to do a step-by-step, -step, pick your eyes, pick your nose, pick your hair, and spend 20 minutes not even knowing what you're gonna use your avatar for. Um, so thankfully, with the advancement in artificial intelligence over the last few years, uh, we were able to create an experience where all you have to do is pick one of your existing photos on Facebook, and we automatically generate an avatar for you. Um, and that's obviously a lot more fun, uh, but of course, you can still customize it. So if you want to look like the king of France, go for it, you can. Um, the second core aspect of presence is social presence, the feeling of being present with someone else, even if that person is not actually standing in the, uh, in the same room as you are. For that, we quickly learned how important hands can be in the social interactions. Um, we did some research and we found that people could actually recognize their significant other from other people just through hand gestures. Um, and even if today's VR system are only really tracking your hands and your head, we're actually able to generate a torso and arms, and we found that in VR, that gave the person sitting next to you a better spatial presence. It really made you feel that that person was physically there. Another interesting aspect is eye gaze. Um, since current VR headsets are not capable of tracking your eyes, you either have the option of not showing the eyes at all and maybe hide them behind sunglasses, or you can try to predict uh, through an algorithm where the person is looking. Uh, and we found that when you're in the middle of a conversation, having the person actually making eye contact is just magical. You really feel like they're paying attention to you. And we also found that in a group space, knowing where people are looking is just super valuable in the conversation. You know what they're paying attention to. We also learned that well, when someone is speaking, indicating it on the mouth is crucial. Um, and we found that it really helps make the avatar more believable. Um, and it also helps when you're in a group conversation knowing who's talking because you see their mouth moving. And we also noticed that when you're in a conversation um, and the person is suddenly laughing, if their avatar is not actually laughing, come on, you can do it. There we go. Uh, it can really break the illusion and you, you kind of, yeah, there's something that doesn't feel right. Um, 
So we've designed a solution where we're basically uh, detecting some hand gestures, and depending on your hand gestures, we trigger an emotion on your face. And it turns out to be super successful. Finally, another very important aspect of social presence is actually being able to touch each other and feel like you, know, you actually are here. Uh, and so giving each other a high five, a fist bump, grabbing each other's hand and shaking, it, uh, shaking hands, is just incredible. It really feels like that person is right here and you're holding their hands. Another key uh, element of creating a really good VR experience is special presence, the feeling that you're there, no matter where there may be. And the environment plays a crucial part in that. Um, it's what you see, it's what you hear, it's where you are. And so as a designer, you want to make sure that people are having the best experience. And so every little decision that you'll make will completely color the overall user experience. Um, if you want to make, uh, so some people will feel different also in different environments. If you make a very small environment, some people may experience claustrophobia. Uh, some people may be afraid of heights. Um, and so as a designer, every small decision you make can completely change that experience. So you have to be very careful and pay a lot of attention. Uh, with Spaces, we decided to be, let people control their environment. And so people can choose any 360 photo or video that's available on Facebook or that they have at home. Um, and that means you can visit you know, places like Egypt or go to the beach in the Maldives or even go back and revisit a memory of your family running around in the forest. You can really go anywhere you want and be with your friend in there. Now let's move on to the second part uh, and talk about agency. Um, what makes VR different from other medium is the amount of agency that it can give to people. Um, the user is literally at the center of the experience and they can freely decide where to look, what to touch, what to grab, etc. And when you feel really present in the space, you really want to feel empowered to do anything you want. One of the main difficulties with designing for VR is that the spectrum of input devices out there is pretty large and they're all very different. Um, unlike mobile where pretty much every smartphone has a touchscreen, uh, here, depending on the VR headset people have, they may have a small you know, controller, small remote. Uh, they may have an actual like, console-like controller, or they may have something like Oculus Touch that gives them full hand capabilities. And so depending on the platform you're targeting, you have to redesign how people will, like the agency that people will, people will have and the interaction they'll be able to do. So things get particularly interesting when people have hands in VR, because suddenly people want to touch and grab everything. Um, and it's also a good source of challenges when it comes to designing user experience. Um, you have to think about what the hands should look like, how they should feel, what should happen when the hand touches an object. Does it go through the object? Does it push the object? Can people pick up the object? Um, and same for user interfaces. Are, do you have virtual buttons that people poke? Um, and what does it feel when you poke a virtual button and your fingers go through it? Um, and can people grab objects and interact with them? So having hands in VR is really exciting, but every little level of agency that you add to your experience just comes with a new set of design problems to solve. And so with Spaces, the way we design uh, agency is by embracing skeuomorphism, which as a design industry, we kind of try to avoid for a long time. Uh, but we, it turns out in VR, like giving people a small set of tools that, and things that look like they, they are in real life is super helpful because everything feels familiar immediately. And so our marker looks like a marker and it behaves like a marker. Our selfie stick looks like a selfie stick. Um, but what happens is when people encounter something that is not normal, that is not natural, that's extraordinary, that's when the magic really happens. So for example, once I've drawn this flower, uh, the fact that I can grab it and it becomes a real object that I can pass around to my friends or stick into my hair, that becomes really mind-blowing. And it really feels like the sky is the limit. Or this, uh, this ability that we added recently, like you can pick up any of your photos and you have this mini like uh, cutter tool and you can cut out a part of that photo. And now that cutout that you made becomes a real object in the space. And you could duplicate it, you can take photo with it, make it really big, you can do whatever you want. So now I can take a selfie with my nephew in VR with a flower in my hair. <laughs> and it's kind of magical. And of course I can post that selfie to you know, Facebook. 
The one huge challenge with designing for social VR is that not a lot of people have VR yet. Um, and so when you do have VR, it can quickly feel a little lonely and you really wish you could show your friends how amazing it is. Um, and that became really quickly one of the most interesting problems for our team to solve. Um, and we created this feature in which you can video call any of your friends using Messenger. And so your friend will see a, get a mini window into your world in some way, and they'll see your avatars and whatever you're doing, and you'll see their video feed. Um, and similarly, we also added the ability to go live so that all of your friends can be with you um, and see what you're up to. And because we care so much about making VR an engaging experience and give people as much agency as possible, we also try to care about people on their phone watching you and how much it could impact your experience. Um, and so one small example of something we did is when you're live uh, and your friends are commenting, those comments are actually appearing as real objects in the virtual space. And so that means a person broadcasting can grab those comments and you know, show them to the camera or draw on them or do whatever. And it's just one small example of like how giving agency to the people who don't have VR yet can actually make a super, super engaging experience. Um, I have a small video of, that we made when we launched live. Hi, what can I do for you today? Hi, Professor Ochoa. I could really use some help with this week's assignment. I can't get my compiler to work. Let's take a look and see what you've been working on this week. This is the one I've been working on. Do you remember this slide from our class? So this will be directly applied to this section right here where you guys did the sequencing. That's awesome. I think I get it now. It makes a lot more sense. Great, it looks like we have a comment from Wayne. Does anyone have any questions about this particular assignment? And of course, uh, giving people agency also means showing them the limits of what they can do. Um, one of the important aspects of making a social VR experience is making sure that people feel safe and comfortable throughout the experience. Um, and because VR is kind of new, people are not really used to it yet. And so it's kind of like the beginning of the internet. People don't really know what's okay and what isn't. Um, and so we've seen in our early testing in, in our own team that we would sometimes throw objects at each other and like jam objects into each other's face. And that was really funny when you're doing it, but when you're the person getting a selfie stick inside of your head, it felt really wrong. Um, and so, so we created this safety shield that people can turn off if, you know, if they, once they're used to it and they don't need it, but it kind of helps people kind of understand the boundaries of what's you know, okay and what isn't, because we want to make sure that everyone is having a good experience. Now, uh, let's talk about interfaces and uh, how we design interfaces for VR and in particular for social VR. So when designing a user interface for VR, you have to think about its place in the environment. Is it a, a heads-up display that's attached to the user's head and following it around at a, at a distance? Or is it attached to the virtual space, maybe attached to a virtual wall? Um, or is it floating freely and kind of reorienting itself to always face the user? Um, and you have to think about what distance uh, the UI is and what size and how it will affect the readability and the usability. And then there's the spatial characteristics of the user interface itself. Uh, you need to keep in mind the field of view and how, much head movement, how many head movements people will have to make to scan the whole thing. Um, you have to decide if you want to use a curved screen or if you want a flat UI and how that will affect the usability the, and the readability of the content. Um, and you have to think about depth and how you want to leverage it. Um, for example, it's important to know, like repeatedly changing focus between two different objects at different depth creates fatigue for your eyes. So that's something you have to pay uh, to, to take into consideration as you're designing. And one of the unique features of VR is that usually your users end up moving a lot, and that's super cool. Uh, but it's also a design challenge. Uh, you need to consider how these physical movements will affect the overall user experience when they're done repeatedly. Um, a UI that wraps all around the user may look super cool when you're showing it in the design crit, um, but once, do you really want people to have to actually spin around like this to scan the whole thing? Um, and, and similarly, like reaching up high, minor radio report style, and just grabbing UIs and all of that looks super cool the first few times and it feels really good, but how does it feel the hundredth time you're doing it? And then the second consideration is the physical space in which your user is using your app. Um, does your experience require people to wave their arms a lot? Do they have the space to do that? And if you design the whole experience to be standing and the person decides to sit, what happens? 
you can't really control how people use your app. And so you have to like design for that. Now, when it comes to designing a social VR experience, you also have to take into account the social element of your interface design. In our early days, we built prototypes in, real, in which people could freely roam around the space. Uh, and we quickly realized that people were not talking to each other much. They were just getting lost. And so we added this virtual table that kind of serves as an anchor and kind of forced people to look, you know, look at each other and engage. Um, and we found that to be su super successful. Um, and it also kind of creates nice spatial boundaries between people, which also feels quite nice. Another challenge was to design a way to interact with a particular object in the space. Uh, after a few concepts, we created the wrist UI that uh, displays an interface on your wrist every time you're holding an object with all the options to control that object. It's kind of like a right click on a desktop computer. And now to finish, uh, let's deep dive into one particular interface that we designed, our top level menu navigation. Um, that lets you access your content, find your friends, et cetera, and what types of solutions we tried and what we learned along the way. Our first prototype was a virtual watch uh, that was attached to your virtual hand. Um, and so it was super discoverable, super cool, um, but we learned how hard it was to actually aim at buttons that were kind of moving. Um, and we also learned that it was quite tiring for the arm that was wearing the watch because you kind of had to raise your elbow for a few seconds. Um, and it was, it, you had to like keep it steady if you wanted to actually be able to click. But it was super quick to access, super quick to dismiss. And so we kind of figured out like maybe this is a better place for a type of, so to surface information that you only have limited interaction with, like a notification, for example. Second thing we tried is what we call the VR tool belt. Um, it was attached to your body and it felt really personal. You just, all you had to do was to look down and you could access every feature with just one hand. That felt really nice. The, the problem is after a few days of using it, we realized that it was kind of tiring for your neck to look down all the time. Um, and it was also quite challenging when you were sitting because you kept hitting your legs, which is not super practical. The third thing we learned is, <clears throat> we tried, sorry, it was called VR Buddy. Um, and the idea was to provide you a single object that you could move around the space. Uh, and then when you'd hit it, you would open a radio menu with some submenus. And then you could hit the submenu and get the submenus, et cetera. That was very interesting because it felt like you could manipulate the whole thing with one hand very quickly. Uh, and you were able to move it around so you could bring it with you everywhere you were going. But the drawbacks were also multiple. Um, the radio menu approach meant you had to wave your hand multiple times to hit something to get to like the feature you wanted. And that was kind of fatiguing. Um, and the fact that you could move it around also meant that you could lose it very easily. So the, sol so the solution we ended up shipping is a three-dimensional dock with a 2D interface on top of it um, that can project a UI or any object in front of you. And that can also be closed down into the table when you don't need it. And that solution worked out for a few reasons. First, people seem to immediately know how to interact with it. The fact that it looked like a tablet meant to people that it could just poke at the buttons. Um, the projector metaphor also meant that you, people knew how to switch between things and how to turn it off. And it kind of felt like you were in control the whole time, and that felt really empowering. Now to wrap up uh, this section, um, one thing that's important with VR, and it's true for web and for mobile, prototyping your solutions and your ideas is the way to figure out whether they're gonna feel right or wrong. Um, and when it comes to VR, being able to answer the question, how does it feel, is crucial. We have seen with some of those ideas, like some of them look super cool when you look at them, like the VR watch, but once you try it for like a few times, it can feel very tiring. Um, so it's very important to make prototyping a huge part of your design process. Now, as a summary, we just talked about what it takes to design an experience in which people feel present in a virtual space uh, and with their virtual friends. Uh, we talked about how to give people agency in VR um, and also outside of VR and the importance of putting some constraints to make sure people feel safe. Um, and we talked about how to design interfaces and what constraints and elements you have to take into consideration and the importance of prototyping. Now, as a conclusion, uh, designing for VR is frightening and exciting at the same time. As you can't really rely on the skills you've learned, you kind of have to get out of your comfort zone and learn new one. Um, but as with everything, both with Facebook Spaces or with, with VR as a whole, the journey is very long and this is just the first step. So really can't wait to see what you guys will end up building in the future. 
Thank you.